Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Armando Berdiel, uh, Technical Development Supervisor with Lighting Design Lab. And today we have another special uh, heat pump series uh, in Seattle with commercial and industrial spaces. It's going to be a great session today uh, coming off of uh, last week where we spoke about heat pumps in multifamily spaces. Uh, and, and again, we are going to be joined by Dwayne Johnlin from Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections. Ben Rausch from, from FSI Engineers, and uh, Julie Banerjee and Emma Johnson from our uh, Customer Care and Energy Solutions Business Unit in, in Seattle City Light. So it's going to be a great uh, session. We're going to also have a couple of uh, presenters from Energy Solutions talking about the midstream program and the latter end of our presentation. So stick around. It's going to be a great one. Uh, before we get started, I want to introduce uh, Julie Banerjee. Pro, uh, new construction program manager for our customer energy solutions division in City Light. She's going to get us thinking in the in the right direction as we head through to uh, to summer. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Armando. Um, I'm sure I'll make this work any second. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. We want to start today with a little cooling food food for thought. You know, this year we've already had a 90 degree day in May. And as we know, climate forecasts project this is just going to become more and more common. So we're talking about how we approach building to consider cooling. We're talking about mechanical cooling, but also maybe approaches to glazing. And we know cooling is already essential for some commercial spaces, right? We see this in offices, gyms, and large grocery. But a third of new construction sales are still unitary equipment and only about 20% heat pump. So while we're emphasizing cooling, we also want to do this efficiently. And that's why the utility is here to help. But what we've actually seen recently is that we've only had a handful of heat pump and VRF projects apply for city light incentives in the last year. We know these projects are happening. About 50% of new office buildings in the Pacific Northwest have installed VRF. So whether it's code, cost, process, we're going to talk about how we're here to help make efficient cooling the norm at the end of the presentation and also talk about some available incentives here for you. Back to you, Armando. Thank you uh, very much, Julie. So again, uh, if you're out there being a design ally, a trade ally, uh, in the field as a contractor and you are uh, looking at potential projects, hey, it is never, never a stray to not to involve your utility. You can provide great customer support, technical support, and even incentives. So I'll plug into your utility. Uh, next slide, please, Dwayne. Yeah, and remember, with good guys and bad guys, if I'm the bad guy all the time, uh, these people <laughs> you're hearing from City Light get to be the good guys. That'll do it. <laughs> uh, so a little bit of housekeeping before we, we formally uh, begin uh, Dwayne's portion of the presentation. Uh, everyone, you'll note you have been uh, muted. However, you can definitely engage with us by writing in our chat on the bottom right hand of the dashboard, and you will be able to see those uh, as questions and comments. So if you want to engage with us, please do so that way. Uh, any questions you may have along during the presentation, you can put them in the chat as well, and we may be able to get it online live or answer it in the chat. Um, there is going to be a short survey after the presentation and uh, for those who are AIA members if you want to have uh, we are providing learning unit credit for this presentation so if you want to get the credit you can uh, at the end of the survey there's going to be a session where you can put your AIA number uh, and, and, and go from there. Uh, lastly, a recording of uh, this presentation as well as the slide deck will be put on uh, lightingdesignlab.com as well as our YouTube channel in Light and Design Lab uh, on our YouTube. And you can see the video uh, and we'll have our slides up in PDF on our website. Any other questions or comments, you can reach out at lightingdesignlab at seattle.gov. Next slide, please. And really, how many utilities have a YouTube channel? <laughs> just wanted to, to, to quickly shout out, hey, a good collaboration between uh, Lighting Design Lab, uh, Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections, as well as City Light's Customer Care and Energy Solutions team, all powered by Seattle City Light. All right. Okay. Um, for those of you who weren't with us last week, Ben, give us your quick intro. All right. I'm Ben Rash principal at SI, uh, both a mechanical and a fire protection engineer and a bunch of other things. 
but the big one to take away is that bottom bullet. I really am a code nerd. I, I really geek out on the incentive structure that gets set up, how we comply well, how we comply poorly some of the time. And uh, that, that's part of why we're speaking here today. And uh, th this is me. I'm, I, I've worked most of my career in Seattle and usually as the technical architect on big, complicated, institutional projects and then for this last decade have been with the city moving our energy code forward. Um, I think as a whole city, we're better primed to make this happen than just about anybody. So launch into it. And by the way, uh, once again, we have way too much content for the time. So we're going to be going fast, but we're both easy to find, especially me. And, uh, and so we can follow up with more on any of these topics uh, later on. But given these, these state and city uh, legislation that you see highlighted in yellow there, this is a, a unique place here that we're like uh, arguing about the best way to get to carbon neutral and to very low energy usage uh, rather than whether we're going there at all. So uh, launching right into the geeky part, here's, here's the summary of what you're going to hear over the next half hour or so of this, of this talk. And and uh, maybe Ben, you could give him a just a quick lay of the land here without giving away all of our jokes. Yeah, uh, we're going to do slide by slide, and you're going to get some Dwayne custom drawings too, which are a lot better than Ben custom drawings. Um, this is organized in terms of cost and somewhat flexibility. Um, you pay more, you get more flexibility. You you pay more to build a taller building, in particular, and we're we're going to talk about all of those. But the big way to think about these, and we'll talk about this later too, is are they single speed compressors or are they variable speed compressors? Those are two big buckets to put things in and we'll, we'll talk about why that's important as we go. Okay, and a little bit about temperature. And, and uh, I, in fact, just had a little email exchange with, with one of my other favorite engineers in town. Um, asking if uh, she was, hang on a second, I have to hit a button there, uh, asking if she was comfortable with my portrayal of these operating temperatures for heat pumps here. Um, that, uh, and her answer was, yeah, you guys got it about right. And still we engineers by nature are cautious and, and, and this, Technology is new and not every piece of equipment is high quality. So if you're in an uncertain bidding environment, you might be getting something that's lower quality and lower performance. But really, you know, Seattle with a, with a design temperature of, of 24, uh, that gets you within even the single speed compressors range. Uh, you get to Eastern Washington and pretty much the range of, of variable speed compressors also works. And in some of them, they're just like really cool. Getting down to really, really cool, really cold, uh, <laughs> you can get down to, to, to sub-zero temperatures uh, uh, before you have to like switch on the electric resistance. So Ben, answer my question at the bottom there, please. Why do so many engineers still think that heat pumps don't work well below 45 degrees? I I believe that this is because we all have heat pumps in our homes that are single speed compressors, or we have lots and lots of experience staying in, in hotels with those package terminal heat pumps and vertical terminal heat pumps. They really don't work that well below 45. They start kicking on electric heat. So our day-to-day -day experience outside of work lives there. And our day-to-day -day work experience, uh, it, you know, experience inside of work crosses all of that back out. So I. I don't have a strong defense of my industry on this one. So all of you who are um, who are working with engineers who are still nervous about this, be nice to them. <laughs> we're we're moving into to what for a lot of people is uncharted territory. Even here, where we've been doing this for a while, and boy, people from other parts of the country, this is would be considered revolutionary. Um, okay, on to uh, on to my. Uh, splits is, <laughs> how did that get in there? So um, uh, 
going for a mini split, uh, you've you've probably seen these designs that that are popping up in apartments and, and houses uh, with with one unit on the inside and one unit on the outside. But um, that's that's my little diagram, which I wrote basically to just figure out myself how how this works. But uh, but Ben, do you want to talk about the the heat pump cycle, how a heat pump works, just generally to get us grounded? Sure. So this cycle has been known since the late 1700s. This, this is not new. This is not news. We have changed the refrigerant. We have changed lots of things. But what really matters here is the compressor. You compress a thing, it makes it hot. If you've worked with air compressors, you've noticed this, the tank gets hot. And when you expand that pressure, that gas, it gets cold. So great, you compress it, it gets hot, you get rid of some of the heat, you expand it, and if you've ever used, you know, I might be admitting myself as a juvenile delinquent of, of your, but if you've ever used spray paint long enough, you'll know that that can, can get real cold just from expansion. Same thing, gets cold, you absorb some heat again, you go back around, closed loop. It's, it's that easy. Heat pump, the only magic to that is a switching valve that flips where the evaporator and condenser are and swaps it from an air conditioner. So you now have you know, the thing inside putting out heat, the thing outside pulling in heat. No magic. So, so it, with, if you're using mini splits, which are, are, are pretty common in single family, but um, you, can, you can make this work on, on uh, low rise buildings pretty easily. It's a little more complicated trying to make them work on taller buildings. And, and uh, well, we'll talk about refrigeration uh, a little more, okay? Uh, a little later down. So a packaged rooftop heat pump. Uh, you wanna take this away, Ben? Oh, sure. This is something we've done forever and ever, uh, either single zone or variable air volume. Tried and true, very simple. Doesn't necessarily meet code now where there is a DOAS requirement for a good many building types. And I would strongly encourage you to go read that front section at C403 to know what is requiring DOAS. That's a way to really put your foot in your design. Um, yeah, but and most, tried and true. most of the common building types do require DOAS now, especially right. in Seattle. But this is a great cheap way to get it done. The reasonable efficiency, you know, high flexibility economizer is a big energy saver when you don't have DOAS. So good. Okay. This is like a good, 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 better, best situation. Now, VRF. Uh, you could see in the in in the cartoon that we're we're just like taking heat out of air, which is just what's so cool about uh, a, a heat pump is that that air that's already really cold outside, still, if you compare it with Fairbanks, it's got a lot of heat in it. And you can you can pull that heat out and put that heat inside uh, it, directly with the refrigerant. And then those, those branch boxes that it flows to can start pumping refrigerant down to the VRF units, heating and Heating one and cooling another at the same time, even within, even coming from the same br branch box. Is that right, Ben? Yeah, they can move heat around um, within the space. They basically use the compressor almost like a pump to move refrigerant and therefore heat. So you could you could have one one space that that's heavily shaded. It's an October morning, and the next uh, space over that's got sun coming in and and handle them handle them both nicely. Um, you'll you'll notice that that uh, uh, it's been restricted up until now to what 90-ish feet. Is that about right, Ben? It was 90 or 100. I just got the new series from a major manufacturer that can go to 135 from the bottom or 150 from a from the high. You know, if the if the condenser sits on the roof. So that's that's rapidly improving. That that was news to me and kind of exciting. And that and that 295 is is sort of the overall developed length. Is that right? Yeah, that's like down and back. You know, it's this total loop length. So we can we can get from uh, up into the medium rise level with with DOAS 
uh, with with the upcoming product products looks pretty great. Now, uh, oh, and and great for retrofit work because it's just these uh, tubing lines, right? Um, and relatively and, uh, small, relatively small, and and so they can fit into existing building cavities or or small chases you build for them. Um, downside, there's a if you count up all the refrigerant, even though those pipes are fairly skinny, that's an awful lot of refrigerant in there. And and um, we'll we'll talk about that more. But but that's an increasing uh, uh, anxiety point for everybody: is why are we doing all this energy efficiency if we're going to be filling buildings full of refrigerant that's going to be leaking out into the atmosphere? So yeah. So there's the R410A and global warming potential. Dwayne's going to talk about that later. But there's also R410A and the this place is all the air possibility. So if you do a really large VRF system in sleeping or non-ambulatory occupancies, you, you really got to look at that system volume. The standard for those taking notes is ASHRAE 15. And there's some there's some caveats and therefore is in there. But um, it comes down to if you've got enough refrigerant volume in a small enough space, you you have a problem, and and with the idea being that for some reason that pipe breaks in that apartment unit and dumps the whole um, that whole loop uh, worth of worth of refrigerant into that apartment. Um, yep, might not be. It basically it displaces your breathable air. Is that right? And correct. Yeah, small enough volumes. It's 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 not like worry about every system everywhere. Um, so sleeping in non-ambulatory occupancies, we really, we really want to be thinking about that. You know, our firm does, and I would encourage everyone in the industry to look very hard at that. By the way, we're we're kind of starting with with most common and and moving down that that ladder, but but here we got a two pipe chiller, and I was trying to come up with a diagram. You could kind of see this looking from the top of a building um, with the heat pump. If you're going to do a two pipe system, save you a lot of money uh, over four pipe, but uh, you've got your choice. Everything is in cooling or everything is in heating, right? Uh, the, right. And so if you're, once again, it's the October morning and the east side is cooking and the west side is still kind of frosty, uh, you could have. Uh, unhappy people in your building, and and it, it's ben, also ben worth saying the first time we've said heat pump chiller. So think chiller, same thing that's always made cool hydronic fluid moving around your building. We just use it like a heat pump. Like I said, that's a couple valves, not magic. It's it's a little. It, I shouldn't under under uh, sell the design. There's some real equipment design in there, but as far as packaged equipment, it looks just like a chiller, and. Uh, it can also make hot water. It, it's a pretty neat thing. It can make hot water down to pretty low temperatures, and those are going down in a quick hurry too. Uh, so heat pump chillers, new thing. Um, now, four pipe uh, not only lets you be uh, heating one side and cooling the other, but you see where the dash nine on the right side is. You can then take some of that heat that you're removing from one side and use it as useful heat for another where you've got variable loads, which really starts to make this shine as far as overall efficiency. And, and this is where I get really jazzed about central plants, where we start getting to share heat between the, the cooling and the heating instead of having to make that heat with a, a boiler, although you're not allowed to use boilers some places now, or a heat pump chiller, you know, it's um it really ups the efficiency. It's exciting times, particularly in the right building occupancies where you have something you always need to cool, something you always need to heat. It's a real win. Now, notice that at the top, I say not for retrofits. Um, you got four pipes. They're not all that big necessarily, but they're each heavily ins insulated. And and uh, so finding finding four big spaces for for those four pipes to go everywhere in the building is expensive and really needs space management with it um it's not going to just magically... don't forget, 
you also have that local dough as you got to bring your ventilation air in separately and you're going to have whatever that terminal equipment is you know uh, fan coils all the way up to chilled beams and, and radiant slab you know that's uh that's all space taking and hard to retrofit into existing buildings so uh if you want if you've got a client that's got good management of of its buildings and and uh wants to spend the extra money to have the the flexibility sophistication of this great most of my clients in my career would say uh yeah thanks Dwayne, but <laughs> we'll pass on that all right we got it we got a heat pump um uh with a with a heat recovery chiller loop did i did i do that right did yeah I, so Dwayne's been doing all the drawings. I suggest a thing and he draws it. It's really quite nice. Um, so historically, this is like throwback Tuesday. Uh, you know, we're talking 20 and 30 years or 30 and 40 years ago now, you do a water source heat pump loop. You'd have a little cooling tower and you'd have a, a fairly sizable boiler and great. It was like VRF before VRF because you got to share heat around the building on a water loop. Great. Now we're getting to the point where we've got these heat pump chillers and we can do that heat pump chiller sitting down in the garage. Wonderful, because you got all that, that ground going on or up in the up on the roof and uh, you can still do water source heat pumps. So when we get to that section where we say our 410A is not long for this world and we say, but what about VRF? It's not possible. That's got some answers of its own for VRF, but here's an, a viable alternative that's not radically more expensive has the same flexibility and still has that energy benefit of sharing heat around the around the building yeah so so ben there's there's obviously some refrigerant in down in the the heat recovery chiller yep. there's also and some kind of water source heat pump yeah but it's going to be there there's no field connections of refrigerant so it's all done under factory conditions and it's relatively small volumes because there's no long runs of piping. Right. Yeah, um, and the alternative refrigerants like the CO2s that are a very high pressure, that's really viable here when you when you get down to single equipment instead of VRF scaled refrigerant systems. Now, when uh, you put them, go ahead. I was, so, sorry for the swift interruption. I don't think it's necessarily a direct question, but we more so got a comment on, uh, uh, hey, is there is there a specific way to learn about the leak rates for these refrigeration systems? Understanding how those could be a health hazard. I think more yeah. so, a comment or a question. Ashray has some design data on this, but it's to be taken with a grain of salt because there was a fitting system that was like press fit field connectors for VRF that were an epic failure over time. So you, you got to go go parsing that data a little to get real. Um, and that leakage rate, it's almost always found during construction, but we don't know on aging systems. What happens with VRS system is 25 and 30 years old. It's at its useful end of life, but the, man, the, the uh, building owner isn't actually replacing it. We know most refrigeration systems leak under those conditions. And I, I don't know. You can extrapolate, but we don't really know. Well, also the refrigerant itself in these very tiny quantities, as you know, it's um, as things leak. Like grocery stores are notorious; they they lose huge amounts of refrigerant uh, into the grocery store. But that's it's not especially a, a health hazard uh, or a, or a danger in itself at those little units. And and in fact, the I. The the bulk of of the problem is in catastrophic leaks where something breaks and everything dumps out. Uh, the bulk so of the problem for building occupants, however, those little pinhole leaks existing everywhere in the world, it adds up to a real global warming thing too. Yep. Uh, one more thing on this one, Ben. You you had a little warning about noise with having yeah. those little heat pumps in each space. Thank you. Yeah, so the compressor lives in the water source heat pump. And uh, just like the package terminal heat pump and vertical terminal heat pumps we spoke about in the um, in the multifamily version, 
that means you don't just get fan noise, you also get compressor noise every time the thing turns on and off. And they're isolated and they're insulated, the actual compressor, so it's it's not horrible, but it's more noise than some other equipment you could choose. Okay, ground source. So this is, I have to say that, that I think this might be what, where we land a decade from now. Uh, we, we don't do ground source heating and cooling because the drilling is so expensive. But um, the, my little diagram on the left, uh, uh, caves worked really well. Uh, I guess some parts of the world, they still are uh, more or less in use that, that that stable ground temperature that hardly varies um, keeps, keeps the temperature in there uh, very close to that ground temperature. So it doesn't get super cold or super hot ever. Uh, in a cave. So if you want, if you want to see how thermal mass works, that's that's a great place to be. A ground source heat pump, uh, drilling these holes that are usually like 300 feet deep um, with a, a U-shaped tube. You can picture plastic pipe that's like inch diameter in a U-shape that's pushed down this hole and the hole's filled up with grout. That that can take summertime heat. And and deposit it in in the ground that you got thousands of tons of of dirt and rock to to slowly warm up so it can absorb that and and then in the winter it can run the other direction and you're pulling heat back out of that and up into the building and uh, in general I'm guessing that the atmosphere in the building up above the ground is a lot nicer than it was down in the dark smelly smoky cave so so this seems to be a way to it's it's the only way i know that you can take you can take summertime heat and save it seasonally for for the the depths of winter because you know the the, the way that the sun is set up is really illogical it's only out there providing lots of of heat uh when we don't really need it so uh this to me is the way we're going to we're going to go forward there are some technical notes, as Dwayne points out, it's got a pretty healthy cost. And there are some technical limitations. The well fields, 300 to 400 feet deep and spaced more or less on 20 by 20 foot centers. Um, and you get a ton and a half to two tons. These are hand wave numbers, but, but they're good for guessing um, per well. So if you've got a sizable building, you also have a truly sizable well field. Um, which brings us, I think, to the next slide. We have now seen yeah. a couple buildings that put the well fields under the building. So there's at least two that I know of. One of them is an existing building out in DC, uh, the Geophysical Union. They did a like 1970s era office tower, six story office tower made in the net zero building with a drilling rig that would fit in their existing parking garage. Was, that's just remarkable, right? So cool. Um, historically, we have said, we don't do this because we can't put in a new well if that well fails. With the new drilling rigs, apparently we can. So that's no that's longer an objection. And uh, I, there, I've also heard of this being done in, in New York City. Under, there's, there is one company in the Seattle area that has a drill rig that can work with 10 foot overhead. And so mm -hmm. it would be possible to put in the lowest level or a couple levels of your of of your garage, continue building above while you had a drill rig working below, because that's one of the reasons we haven't done it under buildings is that it's, it's this long, slow, and extremely noisy process um, to to drill these. But uh, like I said, this might this might be where where we need to go over time. And then you don't care in the winter how cold it gets. There's always heat, you know, heat and heat and more heat. Uh, and that heat pump is living in its its best life at 50 or 55 degrees off the ground loop. So you don't worry that it's five degrees outside. This is this is the thing we're gonna do, you know, if we ever get a net zero Montana project. This this is the answer. And I thought that as far as making connections work, I I pictured maybe you could have a trench every 60 feet or so that would pick up one row of of uh, wells directly below it, and and a row on either side 
20 feet out that that all whereas all the connections from that pipe to the uh, to the lateral that would take it to the heat pump would be um, the connections would be made in a trench that you could access because that's really the only thing that's going to break in one of these would be where you where you sewed them together so yeah uh, and it's heat fused piping so it's really durable um and it's worth saying that there's there's as many ways to lay out a well field as probably well field designers you know there and there's strong opinions on all sides of that don't want to wade into that um but ideally you want the ability to say at least by branch i get this much flow right and, and balance that flow out so that you're getting roughly equal fluid flow through every branch and other than that there is no one right answer it's a, a bit of an it depends and and designer specific uh desire what, what's neat is once you've got that well you can do a water to water heat pump you know and go two pipe or four pipe you can go water to air heat pumps also known as water source heat pumps and just do a distributed loop around your building of that ground source loop water and do those individual distributed ones um, you can go to vrs systems there are water cooled condensers for vrf so if you want zone on zone on zone you, you can have that with vrf with that level of flexibility um and they're all highly efficient um the only the only like asterisk to this is they cost a lot that well field costs a lot but it also lasts many system changes so you've kind of baked that into the project for the next we know it lasts at least 50 years and we suspect much longer maybe as long as 100 years and then the other the other giant like mm, I, I don't I, I don't know about this um, is that you have to have somewhat balanced heating and cooling loads or you will slowly drive your ground temperature up or down schools are a famous example because they don't really run cooling in the summer so their ground slowly cools off over the first 10 or 12 years and they get less and less efficient the longer that cools um, now, so there are some I there did are some the asterisks. I, I I saw a hospital in Norway that uses an extensive bore field, and and they put up a relatively small array of solar thermal on on uh, the roof of an outbuilding. I think it was like eight mm. feet square or something like that, and they just ran a very slow um, uh, pumping cycle all summer long. You know they have those incredibly long days, and and just rotated some heat down into the well field and that seemed to to keep it going. I also know there's uh, an engineer in, in Alabama, uh, the university there that's done lots of these in the deep south. And they he said that that in the in the winter nights, when it's actually quite cool down there, they run a fluid cooler and just uh, once again at, at very slow pumping speeds and just bring bring heat back up out of the ground and off into the atmosphere. So there's ways to do it even where you have a really imbalanced uh, heating and cooling cycle. Yeah, and I love the innovation of both of those to figure out how to make it go, get the efficiencies, even though it's not quite right. We're hoping that that out of this whole this whole audience, one of you is actually got a client that wants to do a super high performance building is looking at this and going, yeah, we can do that. So we we did one of these at the, at the Shoal Shoal Marina, and we did like three quarters of the capacity, and then we have a little backup boiler to figure, to do that coldest of cold days. And um, what was neat about Shoal Shoal is that the water's coming down off the hill, so it doesn't matter that the load isn't balanced and there's no cooling, because the water is always moving heat in underground. Like the underground water movement is such that it it's like recharging the well constantly. So there's something to be aware of there. It's very site dependent. Do these geothermal heat pumps require something like mineral rights for drilling purposes? Only if you're I, gonna do an open loop yeah. system. If you're gonna, if you're gonna, some people, and this gets very dicey with a lot of regulations, but some people wanna drill down and actually take groundwater from an aquifer far below and bring that up and use that and deposit warmer or colder water back. Um, it's possible in some areas and um, have a chat with your lawyer first. Mm -hmm. 
it's extremely hard to permit. There are some in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so it is possible, at least in some jurisdictions, but the injecting the water back into the ground is the hard part. You know, getting a, a drilling permit for a well is not necessarily a challenge, depending on what county you're in. Um, but yeah, injecting that water back down, and there's there's such a risk for possible contamination. It's it's a thing to talk about. But you can drill possibly two wells instead of dozens or a hundred, depending on your building scale. Um, so there is there is a significant benefit to it too. We, um, for Coleman Docker from Muckleteo Ferry Terminal that we did the mechanical on, we really, really wanted to use the sound and absolutely could not get the permit for that. You know, something just reminded me on this slide that I think I have the wrong, but not the very, very, very latest version. Could we take just a second and switch slides? Would that be all right? Or switch slide deck? Go for it. All right, let's just see if we can make this happen in a... Um, we'll see what the, the XX down at the bottom is. I was wondering where my O's were. <laughs> yeah, 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 uh, we're, we're getting there. So uh, I'm having, I'm having a, come on, we can stop the sharing somehow, can't we? Tell me if it stops sharing. It stops sharing. Okay, good. Yeah. And let's see if we can, uh, I, I promise we'll edit out this dead space in, in the post-editing magic for the YouTube video. <laughs> um, fascinating. How in the world does this happen? Uh, let's see. So while Dwayne is playing with slides, you don't Thank actually you. need to see my next slides. I'm going to talk about single speed and, and multi-speed compressors and the kind of systems those come Sounds with. Sounds good. So, yeah, so single speed compressors, we've all known them, we've all loved them. If you have a heat pump on your house, it's either one or two speed, and the two speed compressors are often just a pressure tap at a different point in a compressor, so that it's not like the motor spins at a different speed, you just get two different refrigerant pressures depending on what you select. Um, so those those are great, they're tried and true. And like we said before, they also have temperature limitations. You're going to get down to whatever you get down to, 20 or 25, before you start electric resistance heating. Um, and that electric resistance heating is an important thing to say. When you're running a heat pump, you have a COP of, even at those low temps, two or two and a half. And then as you get more favorable into the 50s, you know, three, three and a half, four, it's kind of, it's not the sky's the limit, but it depends on how premium efficiency you're buying. Uh, an electric resistance is always a COP01. So you're just making the heat versus a heat bump where you're moving the heat from one place to another. So great, single speed compressors, they have temperature limitations. The variable speed compressors of the world, which is uh, VRF, there's a dual duct. So it's kind of like a PTAC unit, but two ducts through the wall, like two little four inch holes instead of a big sleeve. Um, mini splits. Uh, and then Friedrich makes a vertical ter uh, terminal heat pump that has a, uh, they're the only ones making that that actually has a variable speed compressor. Those can all go to much lower temperatures before they kick into emergency emergency heat than their, than their typical equipment. Um, and so that's the one that Dwayne's talking about up front, you know, at five to 15 degrees, depending on equipment. And a few of these give you a super low. So Dwayne, are you I'm, still there? Am I back sharing screen yet? Screen share? So. We, we, we you see it. Hit, hit me three pages down to the, to the first uh, graph. Got it. From the Oops. current slide. Yes. Right there. I have to wait for it to update. Like it's, I've got like a four second delay. Armando, are you seeing the graph slide? I see slide the engineering, engineering view limitations, correct. Great, mine's not updating. We're gonna roll with it. So here's that graph. You hit 20, 25, and that's a Seattle design temp. You're living right there. Your air source heat pump capacity dropped a little. You're probably getting into backup heat. If you're in Spokane, if you're on the east side of the state, you're definitely backup electric heating. And the energy code covers that. 
uh, allows it and, and has some limitations on it. So for the next slide, so that's a VRF side and um, shows the the drop off even in Spokane is very modest for modern VRF based systems. VRV is a Daikin specific thing, but it, same thing VRF. And if you look over on the right hand side, the COP is still really good. It's it's you know 2.5 in Spokane at the design temp. Like you're doing way better than electric resistance. So a lot of times we just pick slightly larger units, planning for that drop off at those low temps, and we don't have electric resistance at all, at least in the space heating part. So, okay, hang on. You're, and then last you're, slide. Hang on. You you were doing an engineering thing there, and could you just at least for those of us uh, non-engineers on the call, could you just at least say what the two axes on these uh, each of these diagrams oh. is, and what's the difference between them? Oh sure, I guess I can. Uh, so the axis on the on the left hand slide is capacity versus temperature. So temperature on the on the x axis and capacity on the y axis. So you you've heard this, it's gospel. Capacity drops as the temperature drops, and that's true because it's harder to get that heat out of the air. But look, that that for this system doesn't really drop off until 12 degrees. And then on the right hand side, it's COP coefficient of performance versus temperature. So that's the other gospel is that your COP is horrible. You should just run an electric resistance heater at 45 degrees. And that is absolutely not true all the way down to the minimum these will operate at, you know, that negative 10. So it's so you're um, still doing you're still doing better than a COP of two, even in well into sub zero temperatures. Correct. So that is right. that is a big deal. Like that that's kind of shooting two gospel items in their in their uh in the foot. No, that's All the right. wrong saying. We'll we'll figure out a saying later. Okay, next slide then. <laughs> Engineering view cost. Are you by uh, the way, are you seeing the screen yet? I'm not, but Armando is, so I'm gonna roll with it. Okay. And then when yeah, you're we're talking, I'm gonna figure it out. So last one. This is the last gospel piece. You know, heat pumps cost way more than gas. And take this with a grain of salt because it's Daikin specific, but We've also seen this in our energy modeling on various systems that heat pumps are three times more efficient, two and a half times at those low temps, and conveniently gas costs eh, three times more nationwide. I'm sorry, gas costs three times less, electric costs three times more. So you end up at basically a wash on, util on energy costs. And for the Pacific Northwest with our hella cheap electricity, you can actually end up slightly ahead add in the savings of not pulling in a gas line and heat pumps start looking pretty good. So that, that yellow line we see on a horizontal line for the, uh, for the uh, gas cost, or I should say rather the, the electric source uh, cost is, is gonna be below that where it shows on, because this is a national graph, right? Correct. The, the Daikin one, yeah. Yep. All right, next. Oh, this is a me. Um, TSPR. Uh, just want everybody to be aware once again that that along with the entire meeting the entire mechanical section of the energy code, we've also got to do the TSPR total system performance ratio calculation uh, to to make sure that your carbon emissions uh, uh, in Washington State are not any worse than this pretty good building that that we evaluated. And and so this is this is going to be good, um, but it it does take some attention. And going with an efficient heat pump system will almost always put you in the right uh, side of that equation. Now, engineering view, comma CO two. <laughs> so that's a wonderful thing because TSPR, the denominator, is the carbon emissions of the baseline system. We're actually going to care about carbon emissions here. What you're seeing here is the EPA power profiler. No magic. You can go look this up too. And it's worth pointing out that our region, this is giant blue region, right? Um, so if we use an electron in Seattle, yes, I know Seattle City Light sources all their energy and everything's great and it's all renewable, but our grid at large is really much bigger than that. If you're using an electron, you're using an electron from this grid. So this is why it matters that going to all electric systems and that there's house bills to 
green bat grid. So next slide, slide 25. You got a couple house bills that are out there, they're already passed, and they're looking at really doing carbon neutral and then carbon free um, in short order. These are not long time scales. Let's go slide 26. Here's your graph. I graphed yeah. those. Yeah, because I'm an engineer. I want I want to see what that looks like. So if you're looking at this graph, this graph goes orange line on top. That's an 80% natural gas boiler getting worse over its life. And then 20 years out, it resets and it starts its life again. It's making that much carbon the whole life. Uh, the gray line is a 90, uh, 96% condensing gas boiler. So it, it puts out less carbon, woo, but it's still doing an awful lot over its life. The blue line is just an electric resistance, no carbon reduction, no anything. And then the yellow line and the blue line are heat pumps uh, over time, essentially, with a, with a COP03. So, uh, so the, the yellow line is, is just the electric, if you're electric resistance, and the blue line is a heat pump, COP03. And of course, it's three times better than electric resistance. But look, by 2045, both go to zero for carbon. So as we talk about all of those things that carbon tie to, it's where electricity is the choice. And this is really an integral. It's the area under the curve that matters. So choosing electric now, even if you choose electric resistance, is a way better choice than choosing gas for the next you know, system life and the system life after that. And and this, those two lower lines on the graph are are the state law saying we're getting to this level of of carbon reduction and eventually to carbon free coming up. Okay. Right. So Seattle, um, this is the code thing. Uh, so electric resistance and fossil fuel combustion for for most space heating purposes, unless you're one of this long list of exceptions, is uh, gone away, which means, okay, heat pumps are where we're going uh, in Seattle. And it's this is currently before the technical advisory group for the State Building Code Council to uh, to see if we can take that statewide. Um, so back to you, Ben, and, and no electric <laughs> or, or gas heat in Seattle. Airside system. Yeah. So what does this mean? And it shouldn't be no, it's it's very limited situations. You are allowed to use a little electric resistance, but it is a little, teeny little things. So what it looks like is, oh look, it, it's the same systems we've already been talking about. Split systems, split heat pumps, package terminal units, uh, mini splits, and then that, that dual duct version, water source heat pumps. Th these are all viable options for heating without electric resistance or natural gas heating. And it's not new, you know, we've been doing VRF in a lot of buildings just on a cost basis uh, prior to this code change. Um, so this, this is not a thing to freak out about. And then next slide, on bigger buildings, it also opens up a bunch of options on the hydronic side. The, the left side is a heat pump chiller. Like I said, it looks a lot like a chiller and that's just a two pipe sticking out. Or centrifugal chiller plants, you can do some really neat heat recovery things when you've got a four pipe chiller plant only on very large buildings. You know, that's that's not a thing you're gonna build until you're a campus or a very large building or a campus scale, really. Shall okay, we next slide. Simu simultaneous. Yeah, and I'm still not getting an update, but if you can hear me, I'm I'm just gonna go yes, with we can it. Hear you. Yeah. <laughs> Simultaneous heating and cooling, special note, you get 10% of your floor area in open area uh, before you need to do some things where one thermostat needs to talk to another thermostat. And so it's not really a big deal, but it really does matter that you're not putting cooling in over here and heating over here and just blowing air across the two. That's a really healthy energy sink. Um, so Dwayne asked me to answer a wait, do we even need internal and external zones anymore? And I gave an engineering caveat answer of, well, it depends on, you know, but looking at what the modern code requires for U values of window areas, particularly if you want a 40% window area instead of a 30% window area, they're pretty high performance 
and I don't think you're going to get huge downdrafts rolling across people's ankles like we like we used to get. Um, so the the short answer is maybe not, and particularly if you're trying to optimize for daylight and a bunch of other factors, we're not we're not building a lot of buildings with that you know 90 by 90 big square plate with this big zone in the middle anymore. Um, so I I think this is going to become less and less of an issue. Also, that 10% is a very healthy, like when you actually add it up by square footage, that's not a door. That's like a whole wall missing, you know, like like part of a conference room kind of thing. It, it, it's big. Okay, additional efficiency package options. Choose your own adventure. Uh, if you, yeah, choose your own adventure. Um, C406. If you haven't dealt with C406 yet, then I don't know where you've been because it's been in the last couple of codes. Um, but you, you have to get credits. It used to be you had to do two things. Now it's point space. And if you screen grab no other slides, screen grab this one, and then you can come back and tell me that I'm an idiot later and that that was the worst suggestion ever. But right. we've, we've highlighted what we think is most cost effective and second most cost effective in all of the occupancies. Um, and honestly, the, the most cost effective are usually around heat pump water heating uh, in that in that particular in that residential and the all other like kitchen occupancy groups. Um, and then it's about equipment efficiency. And from there, it really, really depends, really depends on um, on your specific buildings and your specific occupancy. Um, there are some special mentions in here. The uh, number 10 enhanced envelope performance, um, and number 11, reduced air infiltration. Uh, particularly the air infiltration is a post-occupancy test. If there was a, I didn't make it, well, now we gotta talk about, did we, did we get those points? Did we not get those points? Um, let's hit the next slide. Uh, yep. Adding engineering. engineering notes. What does it take to get better than 15% better than code for, for the number two option? And so you get to average by capacity. So you do a capacity weighted average um, and have to be uh, an average better than 15%. Everything has to be 5% better or more. So most equipment types can achieve this. So chillers, oil fire boilers might not get there. Some chillers might just be limited. Um, Ground source VRF is already very efficient and the code is already recognizing that. Um, heat pump and heat recovery chillers, the rating is still sort of getting ironed out with the industry. And so being better than that is gonna be a heavily cave caveated, like it depends and go discuss with your code official. Uh, and does the higher efficiency equipment cost more? That's one Dwayne wanted me to touch on. Yes, is the short answer. And it also, in a lot of our studies, has a five-year or four-year, sometimes even less payback to buy that more expensive equipment just on energy cost savings. So, yeah, if you're just if you're just removing one widget and putting a, a higher quality widget in its place, then it's kind of just the equipment cost. It can sometimes be quite a bargain. Yeah. Okay. For uh, it's very much for for replacements. However, yeah, we're going to talk alterations and gas heating. This is going to be fun. Yeah. And this is going to get into, I think, uh, one of the more important parts of this of this discussion. Uh, but to just introduce it, okay, pretty much anything you built back into your grandparents' uh, age, you can leave it that way if it was legal to start with. There's very few times we tell you you have to upgrade. Um, you can repair stuff that's there if it if it breaks. But when you replace it, if it's new equipment, if it's new systems, new windows, whatever, those those meet cold code. And and of course, in Seattle, uh, everyone's favorite substantial alterations means we've said you've you've done so much work on this building all at one time that that we're calling it a new building. Um, we we have a couple ways to uh, accommodate the fact that you're it's extremely difficult to bring it all the way up to uh, current code, but um, it's it's a big deal. And if you're changing, doing some changes of occupancy or changing from unheated to heated, then you also have this issue. Now, I um, think we're saying, 
a good portion of our design time for Seattle projects is spent thinking about substantial alterations and taking advantage of, of the, uh, the suggested pre-submittal conference to make sure that we didn't become a substantial alteration when we didn't mean to. And then also breaking the news to the owners that sometimes will be a substantial alteration. You're you're looking to too big, um, so it it matters. But the idea is that is that oh, these buildings only get that level of upgrade once every four decades or something like that. And and uh, so this is our way of of taking like one percent ish of the building stock in Seattle every year and bringing it up to not all the way to but pretty close to current code. Um, and that's in, because we just can't wait for the next the next cycle. That's way down uh, into the danger zone worldwide. For for heating equipment, basically anything that's new uh, must must be must meet the new code. And central, if you replace the central heating system, it's got to be replaced with a heat pump. Now, at least for now, we've said. If you've got one of these many Seattle towers with with uh, fan coils all around and and a, um, a VAV reheat system, uh, obviously you can't. We, we're not going to make people change out the basis of their whole mechanical design each time they remodel a floor. But um, that's a problem we're, st we're still working on. And we did, in fact, make an exception to my rule that uh, new stuff all has to meet the code. It says if there's one piece of equipment and only one and it's failing right now you can replace it like for like now um the question then comes up as it did recently with uh one of our local colleges okay we have a system that's running at 180 degrees sometimes cold day um uh hydronic system how do we convert that to to uh uh to heat pump how how is it even possible? So take it away, Ben. So the, this is a cascading heat pump loop, and this is already existing technology. You got that air to water heat pump or air source heat pump that lives outside, pulls heat from outside, puts it into water, and then you've got a water to water heat pump um, that takes. Uh, additional that takes that water and boosts its temperature. Uh, so right now we don't have a, a unit that can go from air to 180 degree hot water. And as the industry needs it, they tend to innovate. And maybe that'll exist someday, but in, it might be everything that we're seeing here just inside a box, you know, so it goes air to water and then water to water just in one piece of equipment. Right now, there are two boxes, and that's somewhat convenient because that water to water can live somewhere else, not on your roof with structural needs. But right now, that's what it takes. And I know the engineers in the room are, are pulling their hair and saying, but what about COP? It's got to be horrible. And what about defrost? So um, one of our manufacturers ran a selection, a couple selections for us. The COP was 1.9 something with this, with defrost as expected in Seattle. So that's still almost twice as good as electric resistance that would heat to 180 degrees. Um, there is also the possibility that you consider getting rid of that water to water lift. You would need to replace the coils and air equipment, but you could absolutely go the water, uh, air to water heat pump, the heat pump chiller, also known as, um, and replace the coils inside and just lower the loop temperature. It depends on how big your building is, how cost prohibitive that is, what the right choice is. But um, this is feasibly here. The equipment already exists and I expect it to get much, much better because we just brought up the demand for it for every existing building that we really touch in a meaningful way. Well, I, I think that the actual manufacturing world looks at Washington State and we're a, a solid 2% of the national market or something like that and they kind of shrug. But um, on this diagram also, I mentioned at the top in the text that maybe instead of going through all that whole thing, you just replace all those terminal units, bigger coils, mm -hmm. um, and, and run at a normal temperature. Uh, 
I, I ran that by a, a manufacturer uh, yesterday who who very much scoffed and said there will never be a case where it's cheaper to replace all your <laughs> terminal units. So, but it's there. Yeah. Yeah, it has to, to be a small about, building. You want to tell them about the easy, moderately difficult, and impossible mm -hmm. levels? <laughs> yeah, this is my wiener dog slide. Um, so no newer gas electric resistance heating. That That is your margin for substantial alterations and it will put you in a sticky situation some of the time. So consider, we'll start with impossible and easy. So consider steam boilers. We don't, we don't have a way to heat pump to steam, at least not in a commercially available way. Um, just doesn't do it, doesn't get to high enough temperatures. So if you had steam throughout your building, you're gonna be looking at replacing most all, if not all of your systems. Uh, then we already did the 180 degree hot water, um, but the long and short is you can do it with equipment or you can do it with a combo, but you could probably keep most of your building piping um, uh, either way. And you can keep most of your terminal equipment if you're willing to, willing to jump through the hoop. And then the, the third example, condensing boilers that often operate a 120 degree return 140 degree supply, that's living on the edge of what current air to water heat pumps or heat pump chiller, again, same thing, can, can do. Um, but it is possible and knowing engineers of the past that aren't that different from engineers of the present, there's probably a healthy safety factor and you might find that you could live at 130 degrees and live well within an air to water heat pump. And that would be almost a one for one replacement for what had been a piece of gas equipment. Um, every once in a while we run into an electric resistance boiler, which were never a good idea on a utility cost basis because they have a COP01 and you know gas would have been three times cheaper um, and they bring up your electrical service. But when we run into those, they've got all the same issues and those can exist at all of those temperatures, you know, from, from low temp hot water all the way up to steam. Um, but so when you replace it with an air to water heat pump, you will take two thirds of the electrical demand off of that, off of that boiler. It's a wonderful thing. You can, you can go buy yourself a, a nice, you know, VFD pump somewhere. So uh, what, what's the, the best or the highest temperature you could get straight off of an air to water heat pump? So manufacturers say 140, but when we get real, usually over a beer with our reps, they say, yes, we can do it, but it's under these idealized perfect situations. And so you really don't want to plan for more than 130 degrees in case it gets colder than the low temp design temp, or in case your loop flow isn't exactly perfect for maximizing that heat exchange, you know. Um, Got it. We have a, a question on on heating source. Uh, is is gas still an option for warehouse freeze protection at eight BTU hours per square feet or less? Ooh, he's asking about the the low temp the low temp heating exception in that in the front of the of C four hundred one. Uh, he or she? I do not believe that it's allowable, but. Um, if that person could please just send me an email, I'll uh, I'll look it up and give you a more uh, concrete answer there. We'll make sure we connect, uh, Doug Patton. Thank you. I I can say I believe the rest of the requirements still exist. You get away from the insulation values out of that provision. Uh, there is an yeah. even further back provision for uh, I think it's in section one that if you're under 3.4 BTU per square foot, which is, let's be clear, that's like only passive houses can get there in actual occupied space. Even unoccupied, it's hard to get hard to get to that without insulating crazy out of the building. I think that one might get you out of a little more, but I'd have to go look at the Seattle specific to see if, if that yeah. one st would, would get you gas. I don't think it would. I don't think it's so. I think it just impacts the envelope design. But yeah, Doug, we'll get we'll get to you. Just email me to remind me. All right. So now we're at refrigerants. Um, I'll I'll say something, and then I think Ben has a thing to say. But um, but just uh, as we mentioned last week, the uh, how the 
two big House bills over the last two legislative sessions have really said we're we're going to uh, lower global warming potential refrigerants very soon. And so starting in, in 2025, which is not your date you go in for a permit, that's the date that the equipment is manufactured, which is usually a few months before it's installed on, on site. And, and so, and with some kinds of equipment, it's like just before. So it, somewhere in, uh, for permits that you're taking out starting somewhere in 2023, you're into this new world. So um, be, be looking for that. Also the, the refrigerant will get more expensive over time if the new federal proposed rules have have uh, things to say. Ben? Yeah, so we have some projects going on now that will not be built for another, they will start building in six years. Mechanical equipment is probably sourced seven years out. You know, very large civil projects that have the little building scope on the side. Uh, so this already impacts some of our designs. We're talking about it a bunch in-house. And I know we've said heat pump, heat pump, heat pump, and now it feels like we're pulling the rug out from under you, but there are already other refrigerants, primarily in other countries, that already allow every kind of system that we're talking about. Um, so CO2 is a likely, likely one, global warming potential of one, and high, but it's worth saying it's high pressure systems. It requires very high pressure compressors, coils, piping, keep going. So for packaged equipment, not split systems, certainly not VRF, CO2 looks like a near-term future. And then the direct nearly drop-in replacement, it will take slightly different uh, compressors and coil areas and whatnot is R32. So R32 is grand, except it is slightly flammable. It's like this much flammable, like I'm teeny, uh, it, it takes huge concentrations our code doesn't recognize slightly flammable versus really, really flammable. It looks at this refrigerant the same way it looks at a tank of propane. Um, so at least it, until we get code changes, we're not gonna get to do that. But BRF with R32 already exists in a bunch of Pacific Rim countries. Um, it's really not, not a challenge. They could release it here tomorrow and have systems running if our code's caught up. And actually, I, I believe there's a state law that got passed a couple of years ago that makes it explicit that the R32 would be allowable. But yep. the equipment of manufacturers that are offering things in the US are, are not quite there. I've heard, as, as we've been preparing this talk, I've heard from a few of them who are saying, yeah, yeah, just, just we're almost there. We're like working on our final approvals now, we're, but it's a big deal. For a Japanese manufacturer to set up in the U.S. because they have to then have customer service and billing, you know, the whole thing, and and uh, so it's a bit of a move. All right, um, that got us to the end of our part, and now I want to turn you back over to Armando, who will introduce our next speakers. It'll be a nice and seamless transition. Thank you very much, uh, Ben and Dwayne. It's been uh, Extremely informative hearing about the different heat pump systems and uh, the refrigerants and all this good stuff. Uh, right now, I want to introduce Colleen Butterfield and Howard Merson from Energy Solutions to talk a little bit about the Midstream HVAC HVAC program for City Light. Take it away, guys. Thank you. I was still muted. <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm clear Thanks now. For for having us. Um, we really appreciate the time. Um, I know you've heard a lot of information today, so uh, we'll try and make this as succinct as possible. Uh, but just wanted to start by introducing uh, myself and my co-presenter, Howard. Uh, I'm Colleen Butterfield. Uh, I work for a company called Energy Solutions. Um, we're an employee-owned, mission-driven company, and one of the things that we do is support utilities and the implementation um, of rebate and incentive programs for high efficiency equipment. Um, I'm based out of Portland, Oregon, and I'm part of the Trade Ally team here at Energy Solutions, um, which means that I get to do much of the market-facing work with you all and the distributors um, and manufacturers that participate in these programs. So, um, Howard, do you wanna introduce yourself? 
Yeah, thanks, Colleen. Um, I'm Howard Merson. I'm senior manager working in energy solutions, uh, trade online strategy and management team, working you know, very closely with Colleen and our Pacific Northwest uh, group, specifically with programs with Seattle City Light. And, um, I've been in this space for about 10 years. And prior to um, entering this uh, energy efficiency space, I spent about 20 years in the supply chain, working both in electrical lighting and HVAC, refrigeration and, and plumbing uh, supply chain market actors, but um, specifically with distributors. But Colleen, back over to you. Awesome. We can move on to the next slide, please. All right, so the program that we're gonna review today um, in conjunction with all the great information you um, heard so far is the Midstream HVAC and Heat Pump Water Heater Incentive Program. Um, I do wanna say off the bat that we'll be sharing our contact info at the end um, and have some great resources to send you all. So don't feel obligated to get you know every single detail right now, but we do want you to come away with this, being aware of the opportunity that exists and know how to reach out to us um, if there are additional questions uh, about participation. So um, this is a joint program between Seattle City Light and Puget Sound Energy. Uh, covers much of the Northwestern Washington area. Um, Energy Solutions are the program implementers. So you can come to us with uh, any questions and support um, that you may have. Um, the incentives are offered through your participating distributor at a point of sale or as a credit to your account with them. Um, the eligible equipment types include heat pumps, uh, less than 5.4 tons um, as listed by AHRI. We use them as our kind of our standard. Um, hybrid heat pump water heaters and ECM circulator pumps. Uh, both residential and commercial installations are eligible as well. Um, and last but not least, the, the goal of these midstream programs are really to encourage more stocking and upselling of high efficiency equipment um, and to reduce energy use um, and emissions in the region as well. And we can go on to the next slide. Um, so just to kind of go over uh, how participation works, um, it's meant to be extremely easy on the contractor level. Um, you do not need to enroll anywhere. Uh, you just need to work with a participating distributor. Um, at this point, most of, if not all, uh, in the area are enrolled. But if you're working with one who is not, please send them over uh, our way and we can get them signed up and make sure you have access to uh, the rebates here. Um, so once you've made a qualifying purchase, you'll need to provide a little bit of information to the distributor. It's on them to submit the application uh, on your behalf and they work directly with us to do that. So what you will need to provide them is the installation address of where the equipment is going, um, any additional info with that address, like a suite number if that exists. Um, for new construction type situations, you know, cross streets and development names are helpful if there isn't an immediate address yet. Um, the distributor will also ask you for the building type. Uh, they have a full list, but there are options such as single family home, office, grocery store, uh, it's a pretty long list. So they'll need to know that. Uh, and last but not least, um, they will need to know whether it's a retrofit or new construction um, and about when you plan on installing it. And I'm gonna kick this over to Howard. Well, so our participating distributors and for the midstream program, we work with the manufacturers into uh, distributors, manufacturer ref agencies, and then from there into the installer base and then into um, within users. Um, and so with this, you can see that we uh, across the board that we're uh, participating with, whether it's um, in HVAC equipment, water heating, um, in pumps, um, with um, uh, VRF systems. So we, our representation as far as the manufacturers and distributor networks is extensive uh, throughout the city, Seattle City Light region. And this is a sample of the distributors that we're, and manufacturers that we're working with. Back to you, Colleen. Awesome, thanks. Um, so this diagram may look a bit busy and complicated, but really all you need to know is that the process begins when you have an eligible customer. Um, if they are a Seattle City Light or Puget Sound Energy Electric customer and need a new heat pump or heat pump water heater, they are eligible as long as the equipment 
that you purchase meets uh, the minimum efficiency standards. Distributors um, may manage the incentive a little differently depending on who you're working with, which may mean an immediate point of sale price reduction or credit to your account with them. So um, you'll want to work with them on, you know, on that. Uh, you are not technically required to pass through the incentive to the customer, um, but we do encourage it and customers are, you know, aware of the program. So, um, you know, just, just be aware of that. On the back end, the distributor submits the claim to us via a website that we manage, um, and then we approve and pay them back. Um, so you may be asking yourself, you know, why don't I just submit the claim instead of the distributor? Um, well, for one, do you really want to be doing the paperwork? Probably not. Uh, but more importantly, there are much fewer distributors than there are contractors. So it makes managing the program and reaching more customers a lot more effective. And we've seen you know, uh, more uptake with these kind of programs um, when they move upstream to the distributor. Uh, I have a quick question coming in, uh, and it could be for e either of you or if uh, Julie and Emma can comment. Is there a website for the HVAC uh, midstream program, or, or is this more so that communication you are speaking about? Um, there uh, is. So there, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Colleen. I'll weigh in on Seattle City Lights website. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say there is some information on Seattle City Lights website. Um, if your question is around, you know, finding who the uh, participating distributors are and more about the program, um, that we also have a website that the distributors use to submit claims. So there's kind of two different things there. So depending on what you're looking for. Yeah, and I'm happy to share the direct um, list that we have for the residential distributor participation links um, after the presentation. I can put it in the chat as well. And Armando, you can share that. Will do, thank you very much. Yeah, and I'll just add the last slide that we'll present today. We'll provide all of the con contact information and access and information about the program. So you'll be, you know, you, you'll have an overview with that. And then if there's any follow-up with it, you can reach out to any of us as far as with Seattle City Light, Colleen, myself. Um, and the Seattle City Light team. Awesome. We can move on to the next slide then. Howard, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Colleen. So, yeah, the technologies that we're supporting, and as mentioned earlier with the participating distributors, but HVAC, water, uh, water heating, uh, fans and pumps. And, you know, if we look at water heating, and let's break it out from, you know, with this group that we're looking over now, uh, spe specifically heat pump water heaters. We work with um, all of the heat pump water heater manufacturers, um, A.L. Smith, for example, uh, their manufacturer rep agency, Halifa Brothers and Associates, uh, and that includes A.L. Smith's brands, such as, uh, which is listed on this slide, American and State, uh, Bradford White, their manufacturer rep agency is Synergy Cells, and then we have Ream, um, and, and they also uh, manufacture um, under the Ream banner, uh, Rude, and so uh, Ream and Rude are uh, represented by Stone Drew, Ash, and Jones. And then from there, all of these manufacturer rep agencies that uh, that we just listed go back into the distributor network that we were displaying earlier. And so the incentives for heat pump water heaters are $500 per unit, and uh, you can see an overview of the incentives that we offer across the board. But um, next slide, and back over to you, Colleen. All right, um, so as I mentioned earlier, one of the resources that we have available to send you um, if you reach out to us is the incentive sheet. So it'll have all of this information that you see on the screen right now um, in one PDF. Um, but I wanted to give you an idea of what we mean by you know, the efficiency eligibility. So we break down equipment by size and the energy efficiency um, and we use uh, AHRI test standards for the HVAC and the heat pump water heater side of things. Um, and the incentive amounts vary based on um, efficiency level, uh, especially with the, um, the heat pumps here. So uh, just a, a quick, you know, look at what that is, uh, is like, and we would love to send you the full, you know, official incentive sheet so you have that for your own resources too. Um, next slide. 
I think it's actually back to you, Howard. Yep, thanks, Colleen. So looking over this slide, when Seattle City Light and Puget Sound Energy, we're working across the supply chain uh, to meet the needs, not only in the residential space, but also in commercial industrial customers, the CNI space. And so it, it would be good for you to work with your respective distributors to determine the incentive opportunities uh, for the products that uh, would be installed in multifamily and large commercial um, sites, the CNI space. Uh, some of the technologies, for example, we've discussed it earlier today with Dwayne and, um, and Ben, but um, and, and as far as an overview of the, of the technical aspects, but VRF systems, uh, variable refrigerant flow, water source heat pumps, split and packaged uh, heat, heat pump and air conditioning systems, and fans and pumps that are rated by the Fan uh, um, Efficiency Energy Index, which is FEI, and the Pump Energy Index, which is PEI. So we're supporting those type products through the supply chain network that we've uh, that we've given you a brief overview. So next slide. And then as mentioned, we have uh, you know uh, several sources for you to reach out and learn more about the program. I know in the chat. We've also list, listed some uh, some resources. We've covered a ton today, and so we're, we're not expecting you to, to absorb all the information with this brief overview. But you know, the intent for today is to uh, bring awareness of the program and the incentive opportunities and the technical components with the products that we're supporting. Uh, but you can out to Energy Solutions, Seattle City Light, your participating distributors, uh, manufacturer rep agencies, if you work with them. Um, and then we've listed uh, our email address and energy solutions. We'll, we'll quickly get back to you if you send any type of uh, inquiries into this address. Um, we have a hotline telephone number that's also listed. And then our website, which is listed in the resources. And all of this, and as Colleen mentioned, you can access the, the distributors that are participating with the program, the incentive amounts, the equipment eligibility, and in other areas, if you need support, we will be glad to work with you on sales and marketing efforts or inventory needs. Uh, if you have a distributor that you uh, that you have a relationship with and you need additional inventory uh, because you want to be more active with the program, we can work with you and the distributor. Uh, training opportunities, if, um, if you have a need for training, whether it's in sales and marketing, product and program training, we can assist with that. And we, uh, we appreciate your time today. We know um, that moving your customers to these type of products is great for the Pacific Northwest. And it's also uh, beneficial for your business model. So thank you for your time and have a nice day. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Armando. Thank you very much, Howard and Colleen. Uh, wanted to make a quick note. I, I put in two links in the chat, one for the available distributors, as well as a link for the overview flyer of the program. Um, and also got a comment from Holly Floyd that if you are in the Puget Sound Energy Territory, you can visit uh, psc.com forward slash midstream to find uh, PSC's participating distributors on the program. Uh, and right now, I wanna tee up again, uh, Julie Banerjee, New Construction Program Manager for Seattle City Light. Uh, talk a little bit more about the HVAC uh, programs. Thank you, Armando. Uh, well, Colin and Howard talked through how we engage with distributors directly to get you benefits. You might be used to a more traditional utility energy efficiency program where customers maybe purchase the equipment and then they apply for a rebate and get paid directly. Well, we still have some of these offerings as well, uh, which uh, particularly in our new construction program works lockstep with those midstream programs to provide offerings for multifamily, commercial, and industrial new construction. Particularly in this space where we're looking at a more stringent code and you're looking to do above code energy efficiency, we heard a lot from Ben and Dwayne about the strategies, but we also at City Light want to support you in achieving those energy efficiency goals. So I wanted to touch on our multifamily new construction really briefly, just in case that's a space you also work on, um, for what, how we can support you in exceeding code and having lasting benefits for developers and tenants. 
Uh, we support HVAC uh, for multifamily mostly in the midstream space, but we do have heat pump water heating support um, based on the C system COP and the working fluid um, on a per unit basis, which we have listed here. We've also started asking ourselves, what does it look like, you know, in this increase in code environment and changing goals for developers and design community? We talked about cooling at the very beginning. So we're reworking our program offerings to really support key technologies, some of which I have listed here for multifamily new construction, that we've heard from customers are needed for success. We're also looking at shifting to a more whole building incentive approach based on models or third party cert certification programs such as Built Green or Passive House. And so these are some of the options that we provide multifamily new construction. Can we go to the next slide? And then similarly, we have a commercial and industrial new construction with that same approach of really asking where in the commercial industrial space do specific technologies need support? Uh, with central heat pump water heaters, for example, uh, for industrial looking at chillers, some of those surrounding building techniques such as envelope, and then we also support process loads and refrigeration in that space. But we also have some pathways for that whole building. So if you're starting a new project or you're already underway, feel free to reach out to us and we can get you connected with uh, one of our energy management analysts and see what's going to work for your projects. Thank you. much and thank you everybody for sticking with us and hearing from everybody uh from ben uh, to Dwayne to our our friends with energy solutions colleen and howard to our program managers emma johnson and julie Banerjee. it's been a great session for us and uh wanted to know that this is the second of three heat pump uh series deliveries where uh last week we, we were speaking more so on multifamily application today we're talking about commercial and institutional building applications and next week, we're going to be discussing heat pump water heaters in Seattle uh, next Tuesday from 10 a.m. to noon. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, just a recap, uh, the recording of this presentation is going to be on our website as well as our YouTube page, lightingdesignlab.com or Lighting Design Lab on YouTube. Uh, and the slides will be available on our website under the Resources tab. You see uh, Dwayne as well as my contact info on the screen if you have any questions you want to direct to us um, we are available next slide please i think that's going to be closing us out yep and that is it for us today everybody thank you so much for for working with us through this awesome and engaging session i uh, hope you have a great day and again any questions feel free to, to shoot us a note uh, and please uh, complete the 30 second survey at the end of this presentation thank you very much and have a nice day